This is a faculty lecture and not a sermon, but I hope that my remarks today will give some spiritual instruction and encouragement. We live in a time when non-believers and even some believers find it easy to hold mutually exclusive ideas simultaneously. Truth has no objective grounding in the Word of God or the transcendent character of God. And sometimes when we share the gospel with others, our efforts fall on stony ground, in part because our words just simply don't mean the same to them very often as they mean to us. So how do we share the gospel? How do we speak the gospel into others' lives in this kind of post-Christian context? I'm suggesting this morning that one way we can do that is to speak with others about what they long for in their lives. Pressed far enough, I think it's fair to say, we all long for something that this world cannot satisfy. In a word, you and I who are believers know we long for fellowship with Christ. That's what we were created for. The writer of Ecclesiastes, the wisdom writer, states, He has put eternity into the heart of man, 311. In Romans chapter 1, some of the most disturbing verses in the Bible capture something of the same longing. Romans 118, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been easily perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. My comments today are intended to focus on how one man, C.S. Lewis, understood this truth and used it to invite others to join him on his pilgrimage to heaven and to an eternity with Jesus Christ. There are many reasons for Lewis's continuing popularity and influence, even as we approach the 50th anniversary of his death in November this year. He actually died on the same day that John Fitzgerald Kennedy was assassinated. Students still appreciate his apologetics in mere Christianity, the problem of pain, the abolition of man. Of course, a more general public still enjoys his fiction, especially the Chronicles of Narnia, and those books, of course, have sold by their millions. All of us also certainly owe something to Walter Hooper's tireless efforts over 50 years to publish Lewis's works. Alistair McGrath, in a recent book uh, published to complement his biography of C.S. Lewis, lists three common reasons offered for Lewis's ongoing popularity and importance. These are Lewis's apologetics that are still standing after the decline of the logical positivism of the mid-20th century. Secondly, Lewis's religious appeal, and thirdly, his appeal to the imagination, and I think McGrath is right. But I think there's more to Lewis's ongoing importance to us today. C.S. Lewis is important because he stirs an important chord that we all recognize in our common humanity. We can identify, identify two strands to this chord which Lewis stirs. First, We were created for fellowship with God, but we're cut off from that fellowship because of our sin. And second, we can be satisfied in Christ. Indeed, we are invited to do so. One of Lewis's great contributions to the Christian faith then, I think, is his invitation to hope for the glory to be found only in Christ Jesus when we join him in heaven. In stirring this hope, C.S. Lewis is on to something at the heart of Christianity. The idea that we all desire God and hope for heaven is expressed in both the Old and New Testaments. In Ecclesiastes, the wisdom writer states, again, he has put eternity into man's heart. Spends the rest of that book evidencing the implications of our desire for God in that nothing in this life ultimately satisfies the soul. Psalm 95, the psalmist writes that the ancient Hebrews longed for rest in the promised land, but because of their unbelief and sin, They had to wander the wilderness pathways for 40 years before the next generation was allowed to enter. In the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews applies the temporal rest of the ancient Hebrews in the promised land that the psalmist mentions. He applies that figuratively to the spiritual rest Christians have in Christ and then to the eternal rest we will ultimately enjoy in the new heavens and the new earth in Hebrews chapter 3. Also in the New Testament, the apostles often write of a hope that looks forward to eternity. 
Peter, for instance, admonishes us to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you. I'm going to use King James this morning because that's C.S. Lewis's Bible, and I want to honor that. In the earthly life of Christ, his disciples' longing for God was given concrete expression in events like the Transfiguration. This event follows immediately after Jesus tells his disciples that he will come again in great glory, prompting longing for that coming. Then Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain, and he is transfigured before them, giving them a glimpse of that future glory. And in Romans 8, Paul writes that the Christian's whole life, in fact, along with all of creation, is oriented toward this hope when we will be glorified in the presence of our Savior. These are simply a few of the longing and hope references in the Old and New Testaments. The Bible often expresses this future hope in narrative form. Large portions of the Bible are narrative. They tell the story of redemption. The writer of Hebrews symbolizes our lives as a pilgrimage or a journey with a destination. He writes that we desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one in 1116. And in 1314, here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. It is no accident, then, that in its entirety, the Bible recounts a grand meta-narrative that encompasses the whole of the created order and our place in it. Alistair McGrath in The Intellectual World of C.S. Lewis argues that this narrative framework to our faith demonstrates its inherent unity and coherence. And Lewis, sensing the value of this narrative structure of our faith, uses it to give his readers the confidence that faith in Jesus Christ is the proper starting point and framework for our lives, both here and in heaven. Giving voice to the Christian meta narrative of hope is what Lewis did in his writings at a time when many others had lost sight of that hope. In this regard, Austin Ferrer, chaplain of Trinity College at Oxford from 1935 to 1960, and then warden of Keeble College and longtime friend of C.S. Lewis, writes There lived in Lewis's writings a Christian universe that could be both thought and felt, in which he was at home and in which he made his reader at home. And it's that invitation that we're addressing today. Lewis invites his readers to come home with him intellectually and imaginatively to Christ and to heaven. He knew that we all long for something beyond this world, and he invited us to join him on his pilgrimage. Lewis's invitation is effective because all people long for God whether or not they know it. It's not just believers. Witness the abuse of that longing in our multiple idols, money, power, popularity, whatever it is that we use to fill that gap. It's only the meta-narrative of the Bible, however, in that uh, narrative that the frame of reference for understanding this longing correctly becomes clear. The biblical story is recounted in an all-encompassing meta-narrative in four acts, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration or eschaton. C.S. Lewis often expresses this longing as hope. In his fiction, where he establishes what I'm calling an apologetic of hope, Lewis frames his narrative in terms of exile, paralleling the fall, longing, which is our hope for redemption, pilgrimage or journey, which expresses the longing for redemption in narrative terms, and final arrival or restoration when the Christ Christian's eschatological hope is realized and faith becomes sight. Grounded in creation and running through the narrative of fall, redemption, and restoration, we hope for, indeed, are invited to heaven. In the Genesis account of creation, God created everything that exists and then pronounced it good. Adam and Eve had everything they needed, including perfect harmony with God, with each other, and with the created order. In the Garden of Eden, there was therefore no need for longing or hope. Lewis writes a fictional narrative in, of creation in The Magician's Nephew, echoing the biblical narrative in which God speaks the world into existence out of nothing. Lewis has Aslan sing Narnia into existence. If you've not read it, I commend it to you. Aslan sings different notes and tones, some deep and earthy, some light and ethereal for each of the different creature or plant. Wayne Martindale suggests that the creation account in The Magician's Nephew represents the beatific vision of the novel, filling everyone, characters and readers, with the glory of Aslan and evoking hope in them that they might live there as well. This Narnian creation account 
in Lewis's view, provides the norm for the way things were meant to be. We were made for God. Were it not for Jadis' introducing evil into the narrative, everyone would have lived in a perfect Narnia forever. But it was not to be. And Lewis provides a bookend or inclusio to the magician's nephew in the last book of the, of the Chronicles of Narnia, The Last Battle, where he narrates the eschatological decreation and recreation of Narnia, and I'll come to that later. In the rest of the narrative, the rest of this invitation to glory, the characters on the one hand look back, remembering the perfection of creation, and on the other, they look forward to heaven, hoping to arrive there someday. Looking back in memory to Eden reminds us that we are no longer in that perfect place. We are, in fact, in exile. And this sense of exile is the current state of mankind that results from the fall into sin. In the Genesis account of the fall into sin, Adam and Eve were separated from God, estranged from each other, and alienated from the natural creation. In effect, their sin sentenced them to a life of exile, separated from everything desirable and good. In his famous sermon, The Weight of Glory, Lewis articulates our sense of exile and also our hope that the exile is temporary. He writes, at present, we are on the outside of the world, the wrong side of the door, We discern the freshness and purity of morning, but they do not make us fresh and pure. We cannot mingle with the splendors we see, but all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. Virtually all of Lewis's writings express this elemental sense of exile and separation on the one hand and hope on the other. Lewis communicates the idea of exile in his apologetic works, Mere Christianity and the others, uh, and he does so uh, 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 throughout his writings. G.K. Chesterton, who was a significant influence on Lewis, writes in his book, As I Was Saying, that recognizing the fall into sin ironically gives us a view of life that assures us, in Chesterton's words, that happiness is not only a hope, but also in some strange manner a memory and that we are kings in exile. Exile and hope are the Janus faces of our fallen condition, looking back in memory to Eden and forward in hope to heaven. The state of, that state of exile permeates a novel like That Hideous Strength. I think a novel for a time. I think it's more relevant today than it was when he wrote it. In this novel, everything about the National Institute of Coordinated, Coordinated Experiments, that's a mouthful, He's getting at a group that uh, wants to remake culture. For most readers, however, the pedestrian and dysfunctional marriage of Mark and Jane creates an image of exile that is closer to home than the far-reaching eugenics of the NICE. In its right state, marriage reflects the union of Christ with his church. But neither Mark nor Jane sees their marriage this way. Jane had interrupted her work on her doctoral dissertation to marry Mark and now resents him for the delay. For his part, Mark virtually ignores Jane and lives for his career as a professor of sociology, hoping for advancement. Both seek for satisfaction in selfish ways. Neither understands the Christian paradox that to live is to die and to lead is to serve, especially in a marriage. Ironically, if they would give themselves to each other, they would become more fully human and fulfill their purposes in life more. In their selfishness, however, Mark and Jane become dehumanized, especially Mark. In his Belbury's handler's overt attempt to dehumanize or objectify him, forcing him or at least asking him to desecrate a crucifix. Their hopes are twisted and thus ironically all they can experience is more exile, separation, and increasingly less satisfaction, a law of diminishing returns that results in hopelessness. And I think that's the way sin works. The same trajectory of good twisted into evil informs the chronicles of Narnia. In the silver chair, for instance, the sense of exile fills most of the narrative. The story begins with Jill, Eustace, and Puddleglum, great names, journeying north into an increasingly hostile and barren land, exiled from the society and pleasures of Narnia in a quest to find and rescue Prince Rillian. This novel, it's a children's novel, of course, is, however, a classic quest narrative in which the protagonists travel far away, exiled from home, and in order to accomplish a difficult task. 
In the silver chair, Aslan sends Jill Eustace and Puddleglum on a journey that will take them to the bottom of the world, reminding the reader of Christ's harrowing of hell. It's intended to. Here in the underworld, they find a dysfunctional society ruled over by an evil queen. And as their quest nears its climax, they find that the evil witch who has trapped Rillian and plans to use him as her puppet prince when she conquers Narnia. Everything about the underworld reveals it as a dystopian parody of Narnia itself. Everything mimics, mimics Narnia, but never matches Narnia's glory. There are artificial lamps instead of the sun, a pale city instead of Care Paraval, and robot-like workers instead of willing and joyful Narnians. Here in the underworld, evil copies good. Think Augustine, think Screwtape Letters, but can never quite get it right. When it appears that the witch has the heroes under her evil spell, Puddleglum breaks free from her charms and champions the right of Narnia against the dystopia of the underworld, he declares. Suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things, trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and Aslan himself. Suppose we have. And all I can say is that in that case, the made up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live like a Narnian, he says, even if there isn't any Narnia. Captures something of our uh, binary lies in the world and not of them. Puddleglum's rejection of the pale mimicry of the underworld and his declaration of faith in the rightful Narnia and Aslan restore hope to the heroes. They kill the witch, escape the world, and return to Narnia. Lewis often expresses the human hope for heaven in terms of spiritual longing. In the New Testament account, Christ died for our sins, paying the price that people could not pay. In Christ's sacrifice at Calvary, people are restored to a right relationship with God and given a sure and certain hope for heaven. Faith in Christ connects the dots, as it were, making sense of our exile by promising us restoration in heaven. Lewis believed that we all, believers and non-believers, long for heaven. And he called that longing by various terms, joy, desire, zinzukt. He reminds post-Christian -modern, post modern people what pre-modern Europeans knew instinctively from their Christian heritage. This world is not our final home. We were made for fellowship with God in heaven. Lewis calls heaven variously the high countries in the great divorce and our true home are the words he uses in mere Christianity. And again, from the weight of glory, he states, Apparently then, our lifelong nostalgia, our longing to be reunited, notice the reun reunification idea, with something in the universe from which we now feel cut off, to be on the inside of some door which we have always seen from the outside is no mere neurotic fancy, but the truest index of our real situation. Well, so much for Freud. Here, Lewis connects the longing for heaven with the fall, for he says we long to be reunited and we feel cut off. Because of sin in the fall, we are exiled from our true home and we long to return. In the problem of pain, Lewis states, there have been times when I think we do not desire heaven, but more often I find myself wondering whether in our heart of hearts we have ever desired anything else. Longing for heaven is the proper state of things for us in this fallen world. It's there in mere Christianity, running throughout the book as a leitmotif and surfacing explicitly in book three, Christian behavior, in a chapter appropriately entitled Hope. I imagine most of you have read Mere Christianity, and I think it's a, a wonderful help for us apologetically and even evangelistically. There, as in Weight of Glory, Lewis writes of heaven as our true country and states that it is the purpose of his life, and I'm using his words now, to keep alive in myself the desire of my true country which I shall not find till after death, and to help others do the same. And you should take note, I think, of the evangelistic tone there. Longing is front and center in Lewis's autobiography of his early years, Surprised by Joy, which traces the early hauntings of this longing until they are ultimately satisfied in the person and work of Jesus Christ. In the last chapter of Surprised by Joy, Lewis calls these stabs of joy, these longings, signposts and pillars, and letterings of gold which point the way to heaven and to Christ himself. In his fiction, Lewis gives literary shape to the spiritual longing by casting it in the form of a narrative journey. 
In his article, C.S. Lewis's Use of Analogy and Theological Understanding, Robert J. Palmer notes, Lewis was really inviting others to join him in his personal pilgrimage, one in which he was seeking to progress from affirmation to apprehension, and through it all and above all, worshiping God with his whole mind, precisely. And again, note the evangelistic undertone. One such novel where Lewis extends the invitation to join him in his pilgrimage is The Voyage of the Don Treader, where the narrative line is shaped throughout by longing and hope, by invitations to glory. In The Voyage of the Don Treader, King Caspian and his loyal subjects are sailing east from Narnia to find the seven lords who had never returned from their journey years before. At the same time in England, Lucy, Edmund, and their cousin Eustace, I love the opening line of that book, there once was a boy named Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. <laughs> anyway, they're on vacation uh, from school. One day, they are drawn into a painting of the Don Treader, thus joining the Narnians on board the ship. But for the talking most reaper the sea journey is much more than a search for the seven lords. It is, in fact, a spiritual quest that gives his whole life shape and definition, for he longs to sail beyond the sunrise and hopes to come at last, perhaps, to Aslan's country. It is the fulfillment of the Dryad's prophecy spoken about him in his infancy. Where sky and water meet, where the waves grow sweet, doubt not, Reap it Cheap, to find all you seek. There is the utter east. Reap it Cheap's spiritual longing transforms the whole novel into a spiritual quest. And Lewis writes in one of his letters, quote, anyone in our world who devotes his whole life to seeking heaven will be like Reap it Cheap. Notice the intensity with which Lewis thinks of desiring heaven, devoting one's entire life to that end. I wonder if that's our lives. Christians may not think of it all the time, but our lives are indeed purposeful, teleological. We move ever closer to heaven and Christ-likeness. We are invited to heaven, and heaven is our hope. Reap it cheap is Lewis's every man. We're supposed to see ourselves, if we're believers, we're supposed to see ourselves in him. As the sea quest draws to a close, the spiritual longings increase in intensity, as does the anticipation of something wonderful about to happen, and Reepicheep declares his intentions to all to sail on. He states, my own plans are made. While I can, I sail east in the Don Treader. When she fails me, I paddle east in my coracle, a little boat. When she sinks, I shall swim east with my forepaws. And when I can swim no longer, if I have not reached Aslan's country, or shot over the edge of the world in some vast cataract, I shall sink with my nose to the sunrise. The last three chapters of this novel are filled with glorious longings and joys for all of the travelers. As they approach the utter east of the world, it seems to them that every one of their sight, sight senses is heightened. They see new constellations every night. Their sense of sight is so improved that they can look at brighter and brighter lights. They smell fragrances that have never, they have never before experienced. They hear voices in the air which took up the same song that the Lord Ramandu and Lady, his daughter, were singing. They taste the water, now fresh and not salt. It is sweet, remember the prophecy? That's real water, that, they exclaim. Everything is preternaturally alive, all intense and glorious, as their hope to see Aslan's country comes closer and closer to realization. These are all scenes in which nature is numinously keen and more beautiful than ever, thus heightening the reader's hope for heaven. In this fallen world we inhabit, longing for heaven is the proper condition of the human soul, and the most natural way for that longing to be expressed in literature is in the narrative form of the quest or pilgrimage in search of the heavenly city where people can live in unity and harmony. The final and climactic event in the biblical narrative, of course, is the promised new heaven and new earth, as seen in the apocalypse. All of the earlier events from creation through the fall and the earthly pilgrimage point to this final act when God makes everything new and faith becomes sight for believers. In the book of Revelation, John introduces the picture of the new Jerusalem descending from heaven. What follows that glorious declaration is the familiar heavenly imagery of pearly gates and streets of gold. The point is that Paul's prediction in the book of Romans 8 of a redeemed creation comes true in this image in the book of Revelation. The dwelling place of God is with man, chapter 21, verse 3. Thus, faith becomes sight. Lewis points the way, inviting us along. 
In The Great Divorce, Lewis has his imaginary characters, representatives of souls from hell, take a bus ride to the gates of heaven. Now, to be sure, at the start of the book, he states that he's not attempting to present a picture of what heaven might look like in fact, and he was misinterpreted that way, but rather, he's putting before readers the fact that they must choose heaven or hell. The imagery Lewis uses to figure forth heaven in The Great Divorce, <coughs> excuse me, is intended to demonstrate heaven's reality and its transcendent beauty. The narrator's first impression of the high countries, as Lewis calls them, is that the light and coolness that drenched me were like those of summer morning, early morning in a minute or two before sunrise, only that there was a certain difference. I had the sense of being in a larger space, perhaps even a larger sort of space, than I had ever known before. In contrast to the gray town, or hell, everything here is full of light and is diamond hard, which is Lewis's way of showing that heaven is more real, even than the earth. Earth is the shadow lands, to use his term, while heaven is the reality that the shadow lands figure forth. The great divorce is structured as a series of dialogues between the ghosts from hell and the angels from heaven who invite them to enter. Here, for those ghosts who accept the invitation, faith becomes sight. Lewis brings these many motifs together at the end of the concluding Narnian chronicle, The Last Battle. Here, nature is, decreate, is recreated, there's a new heaven and a new earth, and all things finally fulfill the purpose of their creation, which is to praise Aslan. The conclusion of the last battle is both beatific and doxological. Here, at the end of all things, the scene is set in a stable. Lucy remarks on how appropriate it is that things should end in a stable. She declares, in our world too, a stable once had something inside it, that was bigger than our whole world. Lucy connects the ends of things, the end of things, with the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Theologically, it could be stated that the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the climax of the redemption that would ultimately be completed in the eschaton. For in Christ, God dwells with men. And because of that, he will redeem the whole creation at the end of things. Lucy's comment forms an inclusio, or bookend, to the whole series of Narnian chronicles, linking the magician's nephew with the last battle and framing all the other stories within them. At the end of all things in Lewis's narrative, it's eschaton, if I can call it that, there is a new earth created over against the decreation of Narnia going on outside the stable door. It's not so much a new Narnia as it is the real Narnia. Diggory says to Lucy, it's all in Plato, all in Plato, he explains, it's Plato's cave. That's for the undergraduates here in your History of Ideas classes. Everything is recognizable as Narnia. Digger Diggory elaborates the difference between the old Narnia and the new Narnia was like that. The new one was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked as if it meant more. Can't describe it any better than that. If you ever get there, you will know what I mean. I think an implicit evangelistic invitation. The real Narnia is where the Narnians belong. The unicorn cries, this is the land I have been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. Creation has been redeemed and restored, and it is now their proper home. Besides the new earth, there's a new heaven at the end of all things as well. In the final chapter of the book, entitled Farewell to Shadowlands, all the true Narnians enter into the eternal Narnia. Again, everything is recognizable, but now it is all changed. Everything is bigger. Everything evil is undone and everything good is eternal. Of course, the new earth and the new heaven are one and the same. The real Narnia, the archetype or fulfillment of which the Shadowlands Narnia is simply the ectype or temporary pattern. All of the Narnian's hopes from the earlier novels are realized in the real Narnia such that they no longer have to hope for and anticipate true joys. At the end of all things, faith becomes sight. They have arrived in their true country, their invitation to glory has been fulfilled. Now, it's not just the new earth and new heaven that make the new Narnia the real Narnia. Rather, it is Aslan, the Christ of the Chronicles, who makes it so. Aslan is there, and everyone praises him. It is eternal doxology. Lucy senses it when Lord Diggory tells her about the stable door, for, quote, she was drinking everything in more deeply than the others. This is a fitting ending for Lucy. For it was she who entered Narnia first, she who returned on the Don Treader, and now it is she who sees the real Narnia for what it is in truth. 
And it is Lucy who is the first to worship the risen Aslan and the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. In the end, however, Lewis leaves it to the pagan Emeth, who is the last one to recognize Aslan for who he is as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings to describe the risen and glorified Aslan. And his description of Aslan deserves quotation. He says, the speed of him was like the ostrich and his size was like an elephant's. His hair was like pure gold and the brightness of his eyes like gold that is liquid in the furnace. He was more terrible than the flaming mountain of Ligur and in beauty he surpassed all that is in the world even as the rose in bloom surpasses the dust in the desert. Then I fell at his feet. For the reader with the eyes of the Apostle John, this description of Aslan evokes worship and glory because it echoes the description of the risen and glorified Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the chest with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. On the narrative of the book of Revelation, John immediately falls at Jesus' feet and worships him the proper response to the Son of God. So it is in the real Narnia. Emoth falls at Aslan's feet and worships him. It is heaven because Aslan is there and all the true Narnians will worship him forever. So try to pull things together. Lewis reminds the readers in the 20th and even today in the 21st century of the truth that we were created in the image of God for the purpose of worshiping him. His apologetics and fiction encourage his readers to worship God again. For Lewis, the original creation is the normative mode of existence for human beings in perfect fellowship with God, each other, and the created order. In this perfect, sinless condition, there was no need for longing to escape, no hope for heaven necessary. For all things were as they should be. In the fall into sin, however, humans were plunged into a substandard state of things producing a sense of exile because we were cut off from God and we therefore longed to be reunited with him. It is this undesirable state of sin and exile that forms the foundations of Lewis's apologetics and fiction. He discusses the fall in propositional terms in mere Christianity, the abolition of man, the problem of pain, miracles, arguing for the truthfulness of Christianity. He said, Christianity, if it is true, is of supreme importance. If it's untrue, of no importance whatsoever. The one thing it can't be is moderately important was the truth of Christianity that caught him. He incarnates, Lewis incarnates the same truths in imaginative terms in his fiction, putting his protagonists in problematic situations that they need to escape or resolve. In fact, the state of hope and longing is, in Lewis's view, the most accurate expression of our true condition in this fallen world. His apologetics, his autobiography express this longing, finds expression throughout his novels in the form of a quest or a journey. Finally, in The Great Divorce, Lewis takes us to heaven itself, well, at least to its suburbs, as it were, where faith becomes sight. The arrival in heaven is, in one sense, an ending, for it renders hope unnecessary now that sight replaces hope. In another sense, however, it is just a beginning. Lewis expresses the sense of new beginning in The Great Divorce when the ghosts from the gray town get a glimpse of heaven and are invited to enter. And in the last battle, he expresses the sense of beginning and a new, glo- a new and glorified life in heaven this way. And I quote from the book. There was a real accident, said Aslan softly. Your father and mother and all of you are, as you used to call it in the Shadowlands, dead. The term is over. The holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is the morning. And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories, the Narnia Chronicles, and we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. 
Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. All of Lewis's writings encourages his, encourage his reader to long for God and to hope for heaven. And it is fitting that this is so. For the longer we live in communion with Christ, the more we hope to see him face to face. Lewis experienced that wish, that hope in his own life, and his works form an invitation to, God, to glory and an apologetic of hope to his readers to join him. He invites his readers to hope for glory, for heaven, and ultimately for God in Christ, just as the Apostle Paul does in his benediction to the Romans. And I close with this. Paul writes, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that she may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. May it be so for us. Thank you.